I think the things I'm interested in are, are um, way too whimsical or useless or idiosyncratic. I, I hesitate to say personal because I don't think that they're, you know, touchy feely, but uh, they're 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 weird, and I I just um, and I actually really like working in ways where I, I don't um, where no one's worked before. Uh, because no one's working there, and no one's working there because there's no money there. So, um, if, if that's what it takes, then then it, it's it's a wide open field when you're working in the the whimsical and useless. And, and this um, recently, I've been thinking about the ways in which um, childhood experiences of mine sort of <laughs> bubbled up into what became my work. And um, certainly, working you know uh, under the tutelage of my mother when I was a child, um, she's an abstract painter very specifically a gestural abstract painter, like Arshil Gorky kind of thing. Uh, it really inspired me and influenced me. Um, um, one project like Yellowtail, which was part of my master's thesis at MIT under um, John Maeda, uh, was a project that actually got its started interval uh, when I was um, interested in how one could simultaneously specify not only uh, the shape of a mark, but also its quality of movement. And so by making a, a wiggle in a gestural way, um, this would, would create a, a mark you would see, but also um, the, the little details of the curvature would specify the way that the mark would move. And then in that way, one could not only make a, a graphic, but one could perform an animation. So it was less about painting an image than it was about painting or executing or performing a kind of a dynamic image. And um, I don't know, for my master's thesis, uh, I made a bunch of projects that were all um, different attempts to get at this idea of a kind of performable uh, image. In particular, the thing I was interested in was, was, was it possible to make something which was simultaneously a, a visual performance instrument and also simultaneously a sound performance instrument, and to be able to perform both simultaneously with a single mark. And in particular, um, to do this in a way that was completely gestural, where the, the gestures that the user put into the system were, were were not only the thing that were creating what you saw, but were also the ways of controlling all the dynamism in sound and in image simultaneously. I didn't want to have control panels or dials or sliders or these other kinds of things, which seemed like um, useful crutches. After I was a painter and a visual, you know, fine artist, I became a composer, and I was basically my main creative output from the time I was 16 till the time I was about 20 four was was music and i was very influenced by uh, electronic music growing up and it's a little embarrassing to say now because i was like really into jean michel jarre or tangerine dream but that sort of led me because i would go to the record stores and you know i'd go to the new age bins that would that would lead me eventually to brian Eno, where um it was um there was more intellectually to what was going on about about how the music was composed and the context in which it was composed and what it meant to create ambient music or what it meant to um, treat the the electronic music studio as a musical instrument, uh, or what it meant to have been, and I, I I wanted to find a way to um, work in a medium where the medium itself was undefined, and in a way that uh, that music had it seemed like in the mid '90s had already become well defined, and so I, I started out then working in electronic arts. I was influenced at interval by folks like Michael Neymark, Brenda Laurel, Scott Snibby, who were new media artists, and I, I learned about what that meant there. So there were always a couple different um, users I imagined um, for these systems. A system was brought to life by a user, and, and who would that person be? And so it was a combination of myself as the sort of primary test subject, where I would sort of relentlessly say, like, is this something that could keep me engaged for several minutes, or do I get bored by it quickly? And that was my my sort of one of my chief design, you know, desiderata was like it had to keep me engrossed for a long time, like at least five minutes or ten minutes. Um, <clears throat> but I I always imagined that these kind of um, works would would try and satisfy kind of a dual objective. On the one hand, to be what what I called uh, instantly knowable, um, uh, that that a three year old you know could sort of figure out its basic ways of operating it within a few seconds just by sort of banging on it. Um, but it also that it would be sort of infinitely masterable. And this would be this kind of idea that you could spend a, theoretically a lifetime 
learning it and performing it and getting better at it and never really feel like you'd explored or said everything that was possible to say with that medium. And I was about this back at Interval and I remember we, we were talking about how the piano and the pencil sort of uh, bulleted the sort of the, the, the ways in which those two systems had that capacity. You, you, you could, a three-year-old could pick it up, go bang, bang, bang and figure out how to work with either of them. Actually a one-year-old, you know, I, I learned now. But um, then you never really feel like, you know, you'd be 70 years old and you, you've, you're still becoming a master with these things. Uh, directly, um, I think that interactivity as a medium or as a subject for art is um, a subject that naturally requires for successful evaluation and for, for one's own self-improvement as an artist in that medium requires observing people use your stuff. And now, I think, uh, at the time, like, interaction design didn't even really have a name, or Bill Verblank had just given it the name, you know, a year or two before. Um, but now it seems, it seems quite obvious. David Rokeby tells a very funny story um, about how he was working on his uh, masterwork, uh, Very Nervous System, which he had developed over about a decade, and how the very first time he had shown it, he had been sort of, you know, shedding. He'd been focusing on it in a, his lab for several weeks in, in anticipation of one of its first big shows. And so he was <clears throat> sort of working it and working it and working it and working it. And this is this piece that kind of uh, generates sound and, and musical fragments and triggers audio fragments from one's movement in a space. And um, he would he put it in, a, in the final show and, and as people would walk through it, they would sort of not get it. And they weren't doing what, what he was expecting them to do. And, and and so he was like really upset, and and so um, he he went in and, and said, "No, it's fine. It works fine with me. I don't understand the problem. It's working fine." And his girlfriend or something said to him, "David, when you use it, you're twitching in this totally inhuman way." And like he had like basically co-evolved or co-learned like his own special movement sequence in relationship to this interactive art, which just shows you you really have. I mean, as one, I always say like you know, the best. The best user is myself. I, I, you know, I know what I'm doing. I don't necessarily need to do a lot of user studies, but at the same time, like, yeah, you have to like put it out there and 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 have it confront people and have it, and actually learn that you no, know, you've been twitching in a room and that's not how everyday people encounter it. Well, could, so you can describe, uh, you know, without getting into the Wittgensteinian questions of what's a toy, what's a game, what's an instrument. You know, I mean, I think instruments do have a kind of a, a purpose that they they have a, a reason to exist, which is you know, I, I wish to perform. And it was always the case that there was a second or perhaps primary el uh, element to what the things I was making. Yes, they had an instrumental quality, but they existed as, um, as much as they existed as software systems to produce this kind of visual effect or, or audiovisual effect, they also existed or primarily existed to stimulate one's mind about a kind of an audiovisual concept. <clears throat> Example, uh, Zach and I collaborated on this project in 2004 called the Manual Input Sessions. And the idea was, um, it's an overhead projector, and you'd, you'd put your hands on it like so, and if you made a, a negative shape like this, uh, or some other kind of shape, then a, a shape would form in there and you could like release it and it would drop. And suddenly these, these seemingly virtual objects would, would obtain a kind of physicality and bounce around and make sound and things like that. And as an instrument, it's pretty limited. I mean, you, you wouldn't, although we did, use it as a performance instrument. But there's a gag or there's a, a concept or there's a kind of a magic trick or there's a surprise um, or there's a, those are good words, we'll leave it at that, that happens when this happens that, that sort of jolts you into, into not just like, oh, I'm performing, I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm expressing myself. No, it actually jolts you into an awareness of the now and, um, that's something that I'm, I'm actually really proud of now and has something that's, that's been a difficult place to get to because I think that the contemporary arts don't always necessarily respect um, work which is, oh, that's for kids or, you know, that's exploratorium art, you know, um, or it's, a, it's it, that there's a, a way in which if it's, if it's playful or if an audience as young as four-year-olds uh, can appreciate it and somehow there's less serious, you know. I, I actually think it's actually a really tough audience and, uh, and by the way, kids aren't the only ones that play or want to or learn from it or can reimagine the world through it. Um, this idea like if you're, I mean, I had this when I was an undergrad at MIT. I, I, they say, what are you majoring in? I say, I'm majoring in, in art. And they're like, why are you majoring in that? Like, you can't make any money or, or 
it's useless and things like that. And <clears throat> I think there's plenty of good reasons to work in the arts, but but the idea that somehow that en engineering is is to to make useful things is I think a cultural bias. There's, there's nothing inherent in that. If you look at all kinds of great you know work, no matter what what kind of of art it is, there's engineering that's required of different kinds. So is people who work improvisationally rather than in planned ways. Now there's, there's enormous amounts of books, let's say about you know, software patterns and, and about um, you know, proper software management or managing software teams or you know, managing software development teams or how to manage a software project and you know, how to break it down into little pieces and you can give to people. A friend of mine, uh, I'll have to think about that for you. I mean, I'm inspired by a quote from Jackson Pollock, I believe, where he, he says, you know, make a mark, look at it, respond to it by making a mark, look at it, you know, respond to it, but you know, evaluate it, you know, and this, this kind of, um, I don't think it's wrong to call it an improvisatory way of working. You know, uh, you, you allow, you, you hit play and you, know, you get one result and you're like, whoa, you hit another result, you get, whoa. And then, and then sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. And you make, you make editorial decisions um, about what's good and what's bad. And, and the algorithm and the randomness within it is there to allow yourself to be surprised because the computer can do that and because you want to design a system that will surprise you. Frankly, there's, but um, there's something that happens when you're working with a machine that is an implementation of one's will but also has a certain degree of autonomy that uh, it can, I think, you can get it to surprise you more, uh, especially when, you, when the sources of input to it are not just randomness but are also, you know, feeds from the internet or um, other people. Um, and when that happens, like lots of surprise can happen. So many of my friends talk about making a system that, that has surprising results. And those surprises come, from, it's a thrill for us as, as makers because um, uh, I think that if, if I made exactly what I, what I imagined, it, it would be a little boring. So it's a media art. Right. The, the, the Jim Campbell has this wonderful formula for new media art uh, where he has a set of inputs and go into a kind of a gener gener generic computer with memory and storage and a CPU, and um, uh, and then it go to sort of general outputs. And he has this long stream of of possible inputs like wind and weather and you know rain and a bunch of outputs over here like you know sound and image and light and you know. And then you just, the idea is, you, and you do see a lot of sort of uh, student projects like this where they sort of say, "Well, I hooked up the stock data to you know to this device here that releases a." A, a pebble whenever you know something happens and you know and and, and yeah I mean, you get this kind of this to that kind of thing going on i think jim campbell omits there the crucial variable of feedback which is what happens when you know the pebble that's emitted is actually something that's poking the person who's putting in the gesture and, and that can actually create something that's a, a very interesting provocative uncanny or 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 sublime experience and that's something to just it, it's 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 too reductive to say like oh well I've got people chatting online so I'm going to take that I'm going to run it through a computer and I'm going to basically produce like um, audio of speech synthesis of them I've just described listening post which is a piece that like by Ben Rubin and Mark Hansen that that brings people to their knees crying I mean I've seen it's one of the few media arcs I've seen where people literally just sit in front of it and sob it's it's that epic what is it things that were happening they built these sort of meta systems that would allow the data to, to flow through it, but the actual details of the data were completely driven by the people by the, the people who were chatting in these chat rooms. So they would say, okay, for this um, phase of the of the installation, for the next five minutes, we're just going to have people who begin sentences by saying "I am." That's the algorithm. We're going to collect just people who are saying "I am," and we're going to show those and sing those with this machine synth synthesizer. And so they'd go out, they'd grab all these things, and, and that's when the surprise would happen. Because the, sim simply the act of saying, you know, I am in this kind of wild card, like, let's, let's see what happens. You'd get, you know, I'm 16 and I'm having this kind of emotional problem. Or, you know, I'm in Kentucky. And, and then, or um, I'm about to kill myself. Or I'm, I am absolutely enraged at what you've just said. Or whatever it is, all these different kinds of things suddenly form the surprising material that emerges from the open-ended structure that they've designed. Um, I'm tired of trying to fucking convince people that like hybridity is important. Like, like they're just gonna have to deal. You know, I the the world's gonna have to catch up, and I'm I'm tired of like like shouting at windmills. I'm I'm moving on. Meaning, people. Thank heavens, 
it has become so much easier over the last, let's say, 10 years to be a hybrid and to find other people like oneself. When I was growing up, and to say I was interested in combining art and science was a strange thing to say, or to say I was interested in combining art and technology. There was no vocabulary for that. And the only way you'd find out about it is if you knew about this arcane little conference in Linz, Austria, that you know that you would find in you know in, in university libraries, the catalogs, and, and you know there was no internet. <clears throat> so finding other people like myself was hard. John Maida with the Aesthetics and Computation Group, you know, created really one of the first places where one could go study and work in ways that, that you know, were defined by that kind of hybridity. Um, but, but actually, also that it's, it's um, I feel like I've got a community now because I've been, it's easier for me to find those people. And I feel less like I'm an isolated freak, you know. I was working at Interval Research in California. I was collaborating with Snibby and Michael Maymark and others and uh, began to hear about the new program that John had uh, started at MIT which was uh, essentially the rebirth of what Muriel Cooper had done with the Visual Language Workshop some years before, after she passed away. There was a, an acknowledged need within the media laboratory for that kind of thinking. They hired John, and John started kicking ass and taking names. He started the, the Aesthetics and Computation Group, and I started to watch the way that they worked. And for, from the very get-go, 1996, 1997, he had his graduate students creating Java applets online that the whole world could see. And the world, the web was a much smaller place back then, and suddenly the world was really watching. And you, had, you would see all these wizards, like, making software that was purely a form of aesthetic research. And people would work in different and people would work in different ways for different reasons. Some were interested in data visualization, others were interested in typography, others were interested in abstract form and the elements of interaction, others were interested in... Um, uh, the computation itself and what it meant to understand it and visualize it and display it uh, or provide access to manipulating it. But, <clears throat> but they were producing work and putting it online in response to his assignments uh, in ways that no one had ever seen before and because they were working with, with real computation as their artistic medium. Um, but it, then I, I went and I, I, I was there um, and was, I was colleagues with and you know, sat at the same desk as Casey Reese, Ben Fry. Um, others like Peter Cho and Tom White, uh, Elise Ko, and um, Nick Pashenkov, and a, a variety of others who, who out, John Undercoffler was in the other room. Uh, a bunch of really interesting people who worked in a lot of really interesting ways. And ways where, where you know, one beautiful thing about this, the aesthetics and computation group, and you can even see it in the name, was that it was uh, agnostic about questions of design versus art you know, in terms of the social context of what we were working on. Uh, it was too early to say what that social context was in 97. I want to work backwards for a moment and talk about Kyle McDonald. Because Kyle has taught me a lot. And I have a huge amount of respect for Kyle, not only because he is just a monster and makes stuff all the time and has made a life for himself in which the making of stuff is such a high priority that, that it's really defined everything else about him. He's able to be so productive. But he's a real hero of mine, even though he's like 15 years younger than me, um, because of the way in which he has supported and given back to and, and in many ways created or, or assisted the congealing of a community. And he's done that very simply by putting everything out there, making everything open source. You know, everything he does is either open source from the get-go or shortly after it's finished. Um, <clears throat> and becomes a kind of a gift to the world at, at the same time that he sort of kills himself and moves on, you know. Uh, it was seen as a... Uh, that we would be giving up what made us special if we, if we did so. So we had folks like Casey and myself who became educators. Um, but the, how do I phrase this? We knew we had an edge on people because we could code and that was still quite a rare skill in the arts. And so we didn't necessarily want to give away the source code to our work because it would make it too easy for others to, to sort of copy us. And 
years later, I think it, this was a huge mistake of not open sourcing everything from the get-go. And both Casey and I have had this bite us in the ass, frankly. And, and I'll tell you, for example, he just tweeted about a week ago about how he's, he's got all these old compiled binaries from 2000 and he can't find the source code anywhere. You know, that's the kind of problem I've also had basically a related or a similar problem and from like projects I worked on. And that's, that's the kind of problem which is a symptom of, of not actually putting the code out there with the project right, right from the get-go. Um, at the same time, there was obviously a huge pedagogic passion within the ACG that came from John and Casey had it too and I had it too and others had it too um, that, that flowed through the organization that, that said we were here to then spread the gospel and spread the word of, of, of how to use coding in the arts. But I would say that, that and, and you saw that with design by numbers and you saw that with the creation of processing which happened right before my eyes as Casey and Ben got together and sort of started to make this system. But it's a different thing, the system. But it's a different thing to, um, to release the code to one's own work as it is to release a tool that others can use. And I, I think you see this in, in our community still to this day. And even folks like, like Zach uh, draw the line there a bit. You know, they'll, Zach is a huge contributor in so many ways. Um, but he, he, and I, I think I'm, I'm, I feel the same way, um, <clears throat> he will release pieces that are useful that others can use, but those pieces are sort of um, artwork neutral. They don't, they're not an actual artwork. And that releasing the actual artwork um, may have disadvantages because either it's, it's sort of too gnarly and specific and, uh, or, or it is that sort of like, well, I don't want to give away the jewels. And it's somewhere between there, somewhere between there. We all feel like it's great to give away a piece that another person can use, a reusable library, a reusable block that somebody can sort of take and say, oh, yeah, I need to solve a similar problem. That's great. Box 2D, perfect. Now I can make bouncy things or whatever it is. But, but you know, my specific artwork, mm, I don't know. You know, e e I could say, well, the code's messy, you know. Or, or rather, actually, you know what I'd rather do? I'd rather extract the useful piece of there and release that to you than release the artwork itself. Because, and that, that's where I'm like, damn, I, I really... I wish I had been as right as open as he is from the very get go, and um, <clears throat> I've got mountains and mountains of code that uh, I could release, but to do so, it's like it would distract me from actually making new things and all the other you know responsibilities I have. This is what happens when when I think you know the world changes and you know and programming environments that I made stuff in you know years ago no longer work, you know, and just the process of the the, the burden of being a forty year old in the media artist. Is is whether you um, whether you decide to keep your stuff working, you know, because doing so becomes almost a halftime occupation of like porting the shit from last year. It's like, oh god, and that's broken too now, and you change that on me, so now I have to get that working again, and this starts the burden starts to get bigger and bigger. Uh, look, I I feel simultaneously really lucky and also just really sad that I'm not making as many things as I used to. There was a time when I was busting stuff out like Kyle McDonald, and now I direct a lab, and, and I'm a parent, and a lot of my time goes into places where it's, it's no longer about me, and I, I really have to get over that. Um, <clears throat> John Maida has tweeted twice now, I believe, um, Nothing is possible without individuals. Nothing lasts without institutions. And I think he tweets it twice because it's consolation to him and it's consolation to me too. Um, that it, it takes an individual to do something with an institution, you know, to, to fix problems, to, to fix policies, to make things possible for other people, to, and John is profoundly <clears throat> generous in this way of, of constantly sort of killing himself to make it possible for people, other people to learn and grow. Um, and so it's, I think I, I maybe miss making things more than John does. Um, uh, you know, he, he's, he's constantly reinventing himself and, and his la in his latest incarnation, he, um, he's like, I don't make art anymore. And he seems fine with that. For me, it's like, I really just wanna make art. But, and, <clears throat> I've, I'm, I direct a lab, it's called the Studio for Creative Inquiry, or Inquiry, and it's, uh, it's a lab which is basically the arts research lab of, of my school. Um, it's the lab which, out of which uh, the Clouds Project emerged in a, 
probably more than an indirect way. I mean, right? The, we, we hosted the Art and Code conference a couple years ago now, which was sort of the world's first connect hacking conference. So it was, a, it was an opportunity to bring together a group of people who were all interested in um, media arts, uh, new forms of artistic expression, and something that was quite uh, exciting at the time, which was the thrill of this new tool right there that was this the world's first inexpensive depth camera, right? That, well, there's, there's a lot of really exciting things going on right now in the world. Right? This, is, this is early 2013 when you're recording me right now. So um, I, I had a really great experience the other day when I, I told my students in my uh, advanced class, <clears throat> go out and look at some APIs. And suddenly we, we found, you know, not, hun not hundreds of APIs, but thousands. That, that suddenly everyone is, has made an API for something, most of them probably useless, but, but this, that's a dream that like 15 years ago would have seemed impossible. Like, like the idea that everyone would like make it possible to access their data with various kinds of control, controls and constraints and you know, limits and throttles and you know, protections and privacy and you know, other kinds of security met, you know, protocols in place, but that people would do this so that you could m make applications in a new ways. So something I'm really excited about is supporting um, this use of open data. More generally, culturally, something I'm very excited about supporting with the Studio for Creative Inquiry as an instrument are what I would call, in a very generic sense, accelerated projects. And you've been there for two of them. <clears throat> Book sprints and hackathons, right? That that book sprints and hackathons are basically this opportunity to get to get to collide people together, you know, in real life, and get them to you know you lock them in a room, you shove pizza under the door, and you say go make something, and that, especially when it, it's so uh, such times are really are really precious. They're going to become even more, it's going to be much more expensive. So the idea of like getting together some like some super badass specialists from around the world who have only ever met each other online, but suddenly for the first time can meet each other in real life, um, is really exciting because that those people are gonna are gonna really bounce off the walls with each other when they when they get to make something, and it's a it's a it's an important way of making things accelerated by the internet, but also made possible through other kinds of of like book sprinting technology and you know uh, other kinds of ways uh, just simply the conceptual technology of the idea of a hackathon, right? And open source and GitHub and these other kinds of tools. You know, for for collaborative you know version control and things these kinds of things, where suddenly you can get people together and say make something whimsical or useful doesn't matter right and they can they can that can happen. I'm very interested in using the studio as an instrument as an instrument to support that. I think that's a critical way of working that needs support needs water and sunlight and it also maybe needs some some higher level thinking about methodological best practices. Uh, The I'm very anxious about the future. I think the next decade is gonna it's gonna be rough, and I think future decades after that are gonna be <clears throat> even rougher. And without going into all the reasons why, like Carrington effects and Kessler effects and global, you know, weirding and things like that, uh, I, let's just say that I, I think there's a lot of so-called wicked problems that need our attention. And as much as I'm, I'm feeling like this selfish desire, I just want to make my, my art, my little weird, whimsical, you know, kind of studies of things. I also realize that I'm, especially here at the university, positioned to help address some of those wicked problems. And I believe artists and designers assuredly have a significant role to play in helping develop solutions to those wicked problems, particularly by, by shaping how people think or, you know, uh, just reawakening us to, to what's important. Um, but we're, we're sort of staring down the barrel of this kind of the elephant in the room, which is the, the big questions about how we're going to survive as a species. And I, and I, one reason why I say I want to develop expertise in, in running hackathons and book sprints is to think about really economical ways of solving problems quickly, you know, using any means necessary. Coding, sure. As John says, you know, maybe it's not such a big deal anymore. Everyone, every, a lot of people can code. You know, certainly the tools are out there for people to learn how um, easily, more, much more easily than ever. Um, so let's let's get to work.
making, fixing the world and, and making meanings that help us fix the world. <clears throat> but then... Here we go. You recording? I have it on my, my horcrux here. Um, so John says, amidst all the attention given to the sciences as to how they can lead to the cure of all diseases and daily problems of mankind, I believe that the biggest breakthrough will be the realization that the arts, which are conventionally considered useless, will be recognized as the whole reason why we ever try to live longer or live more prosperously. The arts are the science of enjoying life. Um, uh, and you might add, uh, of understanding life as well. So, um, I mean, for me, that, that's, that's why I feel quite okay making, making things which are whimsical or, or seemingly bizarre or whatever they might be. That's my, that's my permission. You know, I don't, I don't need to seek permission as a result. I did for a while. I did, I did work with that kind of beauty for a while. When I was in grad school, I was exploring that. Um, other people did it better. And I like to do things that I are, are sort of uniquely my mind to kind of to kind of dominate if I can try. Um, and uh, for example, Robert Hodgen is a fantastic master of the surface. You know, he spends an, an amazing amount of time really crafting beautiful surfaces. And I was working on similar things as him. As, as Robert, um, you know, I was doing with reaction diffusion Java applets back in like 1998, 99, you know, working with various kinds of simulations to explore their aesthetic potential. But he's taken it so far and, and so with such lovingly crafted surfaces that you just go, whoa, great. Same, same with um, nervous system and the way that they work, you know, in terms of thinking about simulation and its aesthetic potentials, aesthetic possibilities. I still like to muck about in that, uh, mostly because I, I like the challenge of solving a mathematical problem. Uh, and it's fun to engage with that kind of medium that way. But for me, I like what I've, I have a, I lack a better term for this, but I like what I would call like audiovisual concepts. I like things that are sort of, there's a, there's a trick or there's a, there's a, a statement or a gag, maybe is a bad word, but there's a, there's an idea that is um, less about how it looks than about a way it behaves. Um, and that that for me is an interesting kind of content to explore. Um, it's really easy to see things that are beautiful and sort of like, so you can, it's really, it's sort of also, it's, it's a really straightforward path to sort of say, I want to make things that just look really great. Um, it's not easy to do that. It's easy to say that, right? Um, fewer people are saying, I want to make things that behave really interestingly, you know? And that's, that's one reason why that's kind of where, that's the path that I've, that I've gone, right? Is that, I, you know, maybe, <clears throat> it's harder to work in ways that are timeless with with when when with techno technological media when you're focusing on the kinds of surfaces they make because the ray trace spheres that we made in 1986 um, look dated now even though at the time they're like wow ray trace spheres you know it's it's they look so gorgeous but but actually we can see in retrospect the ways in which they're of a time it's so you know laughter I I almost think like. Uh, You, you know how in Monsters, Inc., like, the monsters exist to collect screams from the children? <laughs> and then at the end of the movie, they find out, spoiler alert, that, like, like, ten times more energy can be harvested from children's laughter than from children's screams. And so they, they, they sort of redesign the energy collection factory to basically have these big monsters going around, like, causing children to, to laugh. Laughter is so precious. To laugh. Laughter is so precious. And life is so... Life is so miserable and short that that I'll, each laugh is really worth a lot, and um, it's a really big part of my work to try and make people laugh. Um, not laugh like a comedian, um, but with a very different a laugh comes from a different place in the body, um, and from a different chakra, perhaps. Um, all right. Small problem. What am I worried about? <sighs> okay. Carrington event is last time it happened was the 1850s. It's a massive coronal ejection from the sun of electromagnetic material that blasts right through the Earth's um, electromagnetic shield, frying all the transformers in the world's power grids, causing a catastrophic collapse of civilization. It happened in 1853, but we didn't have electrical grids back then. If it happens, it would melt all the transformers and the 
the act of getting them back online again could be something that would be very difficult with um, huge swaths of countries taken out with no electricity anywhere. You could quickly see sh food shortages and so forth. And so forth. Number two, the Kessler effect is a uh, cascade of space junk. Right now we've got satellites all over the Earth um, and there are little fragments of space junk orbiting the Earth in the same places as the satellites, zipping around at like 10,000 miles an hour. Some of these things are the size of golf balls, some of them are the size of, of bullets, but they're zipping around at 10, 40,000 miles an hour and they're going to take out the satellites. When a satellite gets taken out, it, let's say, shatters into a bunch of pieces and those pieces become space junk, which then fly around. And the Kessler uh, effect is when there's a, a, ca a, a catastrophic cascade of space junk where each space junk um, uh, bumps into other space junk, making much more space junk. Uh, and the, I believe, and don't quote me on this, but I believe that the, the mathematics shows that the amount of space junk goes up exponentially so that it were, it's expected to have a <clears throat> kind of catastrophic failure of all of our uh, GPS and weather satellites within 10 years. Uh, as a result of which we will not be able to see ourselves and communicate with ourselves uh, like we are used to doing. Um, um, third, just global warming and global weirding. You know, the, I'm very much a believer that uh, peak oil happened sometime around late 2005, uh, which means um, that the, the parabolic curve of oil availability says that we're, we've got about 40 years of oil left and about 400 years of coal. Um, and that's assuming we actually burn it all, which would already like do terrible things to the environment. So we're looking at coasts rising um, and you know mass my movements of people and migrations of people. I suppose the fourth thing I'm worried about, I forgot about this one, but it's um, uh, it's uh, 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 the resistant bacteria. What are they called? The um, superbugs. Superbugs, yeah, the 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 the, the <sighs> yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Clap, clap, clap. Clap, clap. <laughs> Expressing myself. No, it actually jolts you into an awareness of the now and a surprise that kind of is that moment when you see the world in a new way, which is the primary reason those systems exist. That, that they suddenly allow you to see something in a new way. And that, that is, I think, a, an important objective of, it, of interactive art, I think, especially because it's inactive, because you can use the user's interaction to get them to a place where they're experiencing the world in a new way. And when that happens, they are very much in the now. And that kind of flow that they experience is something that's very hard to obtain in the routine of daily life. And what you're